Welcome to the CBIA BizCast powered by Google. On this podcast, we dive into stories about Connecticut businesses. Dallas Construction actually came to my school. And business leaders. I think it's always also really important to be able to see a path forward. We're shaping the future of Connecticut's economy. Thanks for joining us. I'm Amanda Marlowe, and today we are joined by Bruce Mandel, the chairman of the Hartford Athletic and CEO of Datamail. Great to be here, Amanda. We are so excited to have you here with us today. And, you know, we've really heard a lot about the Hartford Athletic in very recently, really seeing it pop up. You know, when you're driving, you kind of see and hear about it. Uh, So tell me about how it first came about and how you got involved. Sure. Well, I'm from uh, Newington, Connecticut, and um, love this area. I've lived here my whole life. And um, I've always been involved in the community, and uh, I wanted to do something really big for Hartford and wanted to bring people together and have a spot in Hartford to do that. And there's some great spots in Hartford, but I thought it could use a stadium. So my mission, along with uh, two of my partners, uh, Joe Calfiore and Scott Schooley, was to build, take old Dillon Stadium, and which was down, completely down, and lift it up and create a stadium, and we had to figure out how to do it. So that was really our goal, the end goal being something amazing for this community to utilize, to come for fun, and, uh, and, and to help economically um, drive the city and make it so that people want to stay and people want to grow while they're here. Why do you think a stadium, you know, it's really like a landmark, a place to gather. Why do you think that that's such a, a place to do that? I mean, I love sports. And I think sports are a spot that bring diverse groups together. When I was uh, a young kid many moons ago, um, my best friend's father was the doctor for Weaver High. And they would have the Thanksgiving Day games at uh, Dillon Stadium. And it would be Hartford Public versus Weaver. And I would go to these games. And I was from suburbs. I would come in. And it was the one spot in my youth where I just saw people of every color nationality come together and like I can still sing the songs that I heard at those games and it made a really big impact on me and I just felt that um, that's the kind of space that I wanted to bring back with my partners to life. And obviously you you know in this one life right (laughs) you're you're taking that you're trying to build the stadium you're also running data mail Mm -hmm. how do you think that your experience you know as a ceo has helped in this experience you know it's a great question so uh, data mail is a uh, family business and we're in our 52nd year and i I started there in like 1991 so i'm kind of you know been there a while know what i'm doing and it's been a really successful business we have about a thousand employees uh, we have national accounts. Uh, we we actually make money every year. It's it's it's, and we we've always been in that business in order to kind of have a good life, make some money, and then use those dollars uh, to fund the community. And we've been we've done it. We've walked the walk on that. So, being a CEO there um, has become uh, um, easier for me because my directors and my leaders have become so strong, and the longevity there. The retention is incredible, and I have really powerful leaders. So they're now picking up a lot of my work, which kind of gave me some space to kind of maybe go out and try something new. And I always thought the hardest thing uh, when I watch some of these great kind of entrepreneurs, whatever, the hardest thing is to um, do two things well. Like, it's hard enough to get one business right, but to try to get a second right, I always thought was a huge challenge. And I wanted, I wanted to take that challenge on and it's been a huge challenge. <laughs> and a lot of the skills that I have from Data Bell do not translate into the soccer world. And we made so many mistakes along the way, and we're learning and growing. But um, we do take some of the things we learn with us, uh-huh. but it is a different business. And you kind of have to react in a different way, and there's a curve with that. Yeah, and, and there's a lot of people with their eyes on you. Obviously, in the family business, yes, you've got a lot of pressure. But now you've got this major project that... The whole city's watching. <laughs> well, it's funny because we're privately held, right? And we have a very close family. And we get along. It's one of those great stories, right? Um, and now you go into the public. I had never been in the public sphere. It, it is different. The pressures feel different. Um, it, 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 again, that's a different type of a business. So when you ask, like, the skills that, you know, I learned at, at Datamel, 
no, I didn't have the skill set, really, to come into the public sphere. And I had to learn, and I'm still learning. Um, but yeah, that is, that is a big change. Uh, that is a big change uh, that I'm still kind of getting used to, Amanda. And tell me a little bit about the evolution and kind of, so from when this idea was just an idea to, to now where we are today. I mean, we started in like 2015 with the concept. And um, again, the idea was to, to build out something for the community. And then we had to find a vehicle. Um, in order to build a stadium, you have to have a use, a main use, right? And we felt soccer, we kind of, I love sports and I love soccer. My girls were playing, I have two daughters, they were playing soccer. I was around the game. Uh, I was interested in the game. We felt soccer would be the right. So, so we had to figure out what league to be in. That's a big decision. There was multiple leagues to choose. We ended up making the right decision. But at the time, it wasn't that easy. It was a choice. So we had to choose a league. We choose a sport, choose a league. And then we had to go find the, uh, the dollars, really, to build a stadium. And working with the state and the city, Mayor Bronin was so helpful. John Fanfara in the state was, was incredibly helpful. Um, the Greater Hartford uh, Foundation for Giving was helpful. And we were helpful. And we all kind of came together and pooled our, our dollars to build this stadium. And what's really interesting, this stadium cost $14 million to build. $14 million. And we concede about 5500 Every other, almost every other stadium in our league costs somewhere between eighty and $150 million. Wow. And they're seeding relatively the same. Some a little bit more, 7500 10000 but some four and a half to 5000 So we built this stadium um, before the pandemic. So the pricing was a little bit different there. Yeah. But it's an incredible uh, asset. And this is still owned by the city. So it's a city asset. So everything that's built there, we don't own that. The city does. And then we added community use with it. So the community can use it. So it was kind of one of these home runs. And everybody got behind it. And it made a lot of sense. And then it happened. So we actually got that. We, we've gotten some stuff wrong. That and part. We, you, and we still will. But, you said, but, OK, we yeah, got that right. We got that one right. Like, we have a stadium. It's really great. The atmosphere is incredible. It, it, it works. We need a bigger stadium. We, we may get to that. But um, in economically, to make it work for our club, we need uh -huh. a bigger stadium. And we need some additional type of uh, premium seating. That's how clubs can uh, be sustainable. Yeah. Um, but we're learning that. Yeah. And um, in order to really get the people into that stadium, you need a fan base. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously, the community, sense of community being together is a huge part of it. But what do you think helped attracted people and it kind of grew the fan base I mean, it, for the sport even? It's been incredible because the, the fans are very diverse in their reasons for coming to a game. Some, it's kids and with their parents and they're in soccer or they're not, but they just want to get out and have a great night. It's from 7 o'clock to 8.45. That's it. So you can get there at 6.45 and you can be home by 9, 9.05. It's like that nice little piece of time that you can have. But then the community is also soccer lovers, right? People who are really vested in the game, watch the World Cup, watch the premiere. We get that crew, right? And, and then we just get people a little bit kind of a gen, I don't know what they're called, Z, X, whatever it is, but like beer drinkers and fun people, they want to get out for an atmosphere. And then we had the supporter groups that just popped up organically. Like we're not involved with them. They're organic and they're out there banging drums for 90 minutes, win, lose, or draw. And I think people saw that and was like, what, what kind of a atmosphere? There's kind of something for everyone. Yeah. The food's amazing. There's food trucks. There's, you know, all kinds of things to drink and eat. Was this kind of what you envisioned, or were there some groups that kind of surprised you? I mean, I was really surprised by the supporter groups. Uh, I didn't know that um, soccer, that's a, that's a European thing. I didn't know we would have that and that they would be authentic. They would, meaning, it's their group. They make the decisions. They run it. Um, they decide what songs to sing, what drums to play. What. So I had no idea about that. That was like a real winner for us, and they've been incredible. Um, I mean, listen, if we step out of line at all, if they see something, boom. They're there also to kind of make sure that this club uh, holds the line to be a community-based, strong, family-oriented club. So 
they're there to say, hey, wait a minute here. We didn't like this decision, and we have great communication path with them and their leadership. Yeah, so we've got like a little uh, welcome to Wrexham thing brewing here in Hartford, you think? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, Wrexham's unbelievable. Uh, it's different uh, in some ways. Europe, I mean, these European clubs have been around for 100 years, um, and they don't have you know, multi-sports in, in Europe the way we have in America. There's yeah. so many choices here, right? And I think that's... That's a key is to find your niche and whether it's, you know, parents with their kids or whether it's soccer fans or whether it's people coming out to have a great time, we got to get our niche and we, we, our fans have been unbelievable. Well, that's the challenge too, right? You've got a couple, you know, other sports that sure. big sports here in Hartford and, you know, how do you differentiate yourself? And, and, and I think it's the atmosphere and I think it's the time frame. And I think it's the incredible athletes on the field, the actual players. If you come to a game, I like to go in the second half behind the goal. And you're right down. I mean, that's the thing about our stadium. You're on the field. And people from all over the world come to, to kind of hang out and see. We get you know, people from England and from Italy to come. These are soccer people. And they can't believe how we're right on the field. And being right on the field, you get to see these incredible athletes. And it's like, whoa which is way different than sitting up top and you know and I love hockey but you don't get the sense in hockey of these incredible athletes like you do watching these players like go at it. And speaking of incredible athletes, you guys have hosted some pretty big games, uh, some big teams. Tell me about that. I mean, the part of part of having a stadium is figuring out how to utilize it, right? And um, bringing in teams from international teams. We had Jamaican national team, the Puerto Rican national team. We have a big tournament coming in with four teams from Central America, top teams to play. So it, it is also for these soccer real aficionados, it's an opportunity to get more. And our stadium is cool because it's like 6,000. We have incredible operations staff, so there's never an issue there. They come in, come out. The, the, the police in Hartford have been awesome. We haven't had one issue in four years. I'm, I'm talking not one. So that's been incredible too. So yeah, attracting clubs is something we love to do, and we're going to do even more of it. And attracting different levels of fan bases is something that seems, you know, you've added some new perks for fans this year. Uh, why? Yeah, well, you, you have to. And, um, you know, again, there's so many choices. And for a season ticket holder, and we have over 1,000, um, to put their money down to, to go to 17 games, and maybe they're not going to go all, but to be vested in the club, you gotta, you got to give, right? It has to have a value. So we do things like preferred parking or speed lines for them or meet the coaches and meet the players. We can't think of enough things to give. <laughs> we'll give them all. If they think of them, we'll give those too. But you have to deliver on the value side, and I think it's one of the great things about the experience I've had in, in, in this sport in Hartford at our stadium is the feedback. When fans come to the game, they have an amazing time. I mean, we go around, we take surveys, we do blind surveys. We want, we want information. I give out my cell number, okay? Like, call me, text me. It's amazing how few people actually do. <laughs> but I welcome it because you really learn. But the feedback's been incredible, and it makes you feel good. It makes yeah. our team feel good and our operations team feel good. What other things are you doing this summer um, that you're particularly excited about? I don't know when the podcast goes out, but yeah. we have a huge uh, music uh, festival. So this is brand new for us. So we're bringing in uh, an 80s night and then a reggae night. And again, trying to use that stadium to bring people together. Um, and and we'll see how that goes. Um, it's Hoffman Auto is the sponsor. So that's the other thing. The sponsors here in, in Hartford have been incredible. Trinity Health, who's our main sponsor, uh, just bought in completely to this idea of making Hartford better and how that helps everyone. But, you know, Stanley, the Hartford, Travelers, all the players that, that you really need, you can't make it work without them. But then there's all these, like, second tier, kind of second level in terms of size um, players that have come in. We have over 80 sponsors for our team. So, so doing other events and getting them to participate in that is not hard. The hard part is driving fans. Like, that's always the key, to your point, Amanda. How do we drive them? When there's so much going on and there's so many things happening, how do you drive them to these opportunities? I think that takes a lot of time and a lot of work, but we're, we're doing pretty well there. And that's kind of why we're starting to see things like fan um, season ticket holder perks, exactly. more events, bigger teams really coming in too. So the other, the other aspect which 
you know, some wins. Like, we got the stadium. The other one that I love is the mascot. We have this mascot, Dylan, and it's uh, he, she, I'm not going to say, or whatever, is incredible. And the kids love it. I love it. I mean, all the fans love it. So, you, again, bringing these additional, it seems small, right, a mascot, but it adds to that atmosphere. And then that mascot can go around and go to the hospitals. It can go to the schools, the elementary schools, and we place them around. It helps us from a branding standpoint. Yeah, it's a big marketing piece. Right, but it's also a very positive kind of interaction, right? So... Yeah, Dylan. We, we love Dylan. <laughs> we love Dylan. <laughs> um, and, you know, in terms of, I know you said you have a lot of support uh, from sponsors, but how, how else can the business community support you in this endeavor? So I think the spot that I really want to work on in the next year or two is more corporate outings. Um, so we play on Saturday night, so there's some challenges there. It could be a great thing because it's not a business day, but it could be tricky because maybe you're not in downtown Hartford. I think the Yard Goats do an amazing job with that. They're an incredible club. We're friendly. We get along. I learn from them so much. Um, they do a great job. I think we could do a better job there. So from the corporate community, I have to deliver value there for them to bring out their people. So we that's the spot we want to get better. We want more pre premium seating. We've added some containers, and we've added some different type of tents. Uh, to make it really kind of cool down there and fun near the field. A special, unique kind of experience. Exactly, exactly Amanda. And, but I think that's a growth area, and, and I'm hoping that um, the business community will grab onto that. Um, in terms of sponsorship, they've been awesome. I can't really ask for much more there. Um, we're, we, we do very well, and the, when the league looks at us, there's 25 teams in our league, um, we, we stand out as being very strong on, on the sponsorship side. Um, so we want to keep delivering value to those sponsors and keep kind of incrementally growing that. Um, but I think bringing more fans in is really the key, whether it's corporate or non-corporate fans. Great. So we've talked about kind of the, the purpose, really bringing the community together, the business aspect. But you also do a lot, the Hartford Athletic, you know, the club as a whole does a lot to give back to the community. I think it was 2020 when you established the Green and Blue Foundation. Talk to me about that. Yeah, again, that, that uh, my partners and, and I, that was something very important that we would start a foundation. It's a Green and Blue Foundation. Um, and um, they are doing all kinds of things. We've raised uh, this year over $750,000 to give back to the community in all kinds of different ways, whether it's a community ticket program where we can have underserved kids come to the games and which is amazing, or we do the diversity and, and hiring uh, event, which you know the governor was at, and, and people landed like hundreds of jobs through that, or whether it's the Aurora Foundation where they hold an evening there. There's so many different types of community uh, efforts, and you know that feels good to kind of utilize the Hartford Athletic brand um, to support these 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 community elements that really need help. And, and uh, that's part of our mission. So uh, we're doing, we're, we're, we want to grow that, um, and we're always looking for uh, additional community partners to, to partner with and, and do more. So, Do you feel like that kind of helps fulfill you know, the back end of your initial goals as well? 100%. Um, that's that. It, it's a great point, Amanda, because, yeah, it wasn't... Uh, it wasn't like the primary goal was more of a community play and getting people down and interacting in different, yeah. different cultures. I really love that aspect, and soccer is the best for that um, for as a vehicle. But you're right. It's always in my mind. Like I said earlier, we, we, we try to do a good job and make some money so that we can give back. That's, that's been something that you know, I grew up with. My parents taught me very early is that's why you, that's why you try to compete and earn is that so that you can get to a point where you can help others? And um, you know, and I have I have two daughters now that are out in the world doing that same thing that I'm very proud of. So, like that's kind of the give back, and and um, we'll continue to grow that. Um, the key for us really is sustainability as a business, and it's very challenging in soccer. So we have to kind of continue to look for ways to attract fans, attract sponsors, so that. Because if, if you're not sustainable, then you can't do these other things that you really want to do. And, and you guys also have the uh, Hartford Athletic Youth Academy as well. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, this has been an incredible experience. So 
Um, with the help of, of some local parents, uh, Jason Price being one of uh, the leaders, we built a uh, what's called a U19 team, and that's like the top level team, and that's free for people to play. And so the best players, young players, and those are 15 year olds to like 18, can come play for free and play with uh, under the the guidance of professional athletes, professional coaches, and and for them it's a dream to play in college or for some of them to play pro. And in the state of Connecticut um, and, and many places, other places, you have to pay actually to join a team like that. So what we did is drop that barrier. And that's the top of our pyramid, we call it, right? And that's where everyone strives to, to go. We then dropped down a little bit and said, okay, what, can, should we start some teams, some lower teams? I said, okay, let's, let's do a social media and invite kids to come out from ages eight to 15 for tryouts. And we dropped one like social media on a Saturday. We had 550 kids show up. Wow. I couldn't believe it. And like, I was like, wait a minute, maybe this brand is like stronger <laughs> than I like anticipated. And these kids were amazing. We got great players. So we've built now a bunch of teams and this is on the boys start to start the boys. And we're gonna go to the girls for sure. But we're just learning. So it's really our first kickoff year this year, kind of going in. And we work closely with some of the other clubs in the area, and we try to be very, very respectful there um, on their players and you know how we operate with them. That's always a, a question, right? There are customers, too, in terms of sending people to games, and we respect them in the work that they do. So we have to find ways to work together, and I think we've done a really good job at that, and we'll do even better. But it's really exciting, and this is really an opportunity for kids, regardless of the dollars that they have, the backgrounds they come from, um, to come out and if you're good enough, um, learn the game from the best and go with it. And that's something that, that I think has really not been done uh, in many places in the United States. And I think it's a reason that uh, in some ways we don't have uh, the top teams in the world because we do have the best athletes in the world and we need to give them a pathway um, so that we can win this 2026 World Cup. And uh, we just want to be part of that ecosystem. And uh, so that's kicking off, and it's really exciting. We're going to grow it, and I can't wait to grow it on, on the girls' side, too. And I'm sure that's very rewarding for the club as well. It is. And even for our players and our coaches, I mean, what's better than working with uh, young boys up to age 18 that are striving to be the best that they can to grow? I mean, they're so serious. I watch their games. They're amazing. They're so talented. Like, I, shockingly, we have our pro coaches like can't believe how talented these young kids are. So there's something happening here, um, and it's it is it is a piece of kind of fun and a little bit of a community play, and and we get tickets uh, you know sold off of it too. And there's a lot of kind of pieces to it, but this goes year round, so it goes all the way through the year. There's different opportunities for these kids. Anybody who's interested should look uh, at the Hartford Athletic Youth Academy website and uh, I think you get a kick out of watching these kick I say you know and watching these uh, <laughs> sorry I was supposed to laugh on that yeah pun exactly earlier. my little <laughs> only pun unintended pun but um, it's a growth area for us um, and um, I'm really excited to see what we can do in Connecticut you have to rely a lot uh, around you know what's happening I'm sure you know when there's big tournaments or we've got the World Cup um, yeah. You know, we're seeing a lot of advances in even women's soccer that really, in the end, is helping you guys, too. A hundred percent. I mean, it lifts, like they say, it lifts all boats. So, I mean, we have the World Cup coming in 2026, and uh, I, I remember, I think it was 1990 was the last one. I went to some games. It, it's a game changer. It, it, like, you can't even, you can talk about it, you can think about it, but when it happens, the magic and the atmospheres around this country and in Canada and Mexico are it's incredible. And it's going to... It's going to just build on soccer. And to your point, today, right now, they're playing the Women's World Cup in Australia. Mm -hmm. Women's soccer is just blown up. And it, it has an incredible uh, trajectory that it's going to follow. And we want to be a part of that. So we're figuring out uh, how to get into that game. And again, it comes down to the sustainability and strength from an operation side. We know we have to really find our way to be sustainable and have a strong operational team to handle the next large project, which would be a pro women's team. 
And we have an avenue to do it. We're being asked to do it. We'll probably have to raise some money to do it. But that's, that's so exciting. And I, I think there's a big growth curve there. And then what happens to Hartford? Now we have a pro women's team, pro men's team. We have a huge academy that we're running now that took off this year, which, which is awesome. So, you know, again, it's, it's kind of connecting all these dots and we'll see where it goes. You know, we've, we have talked a little bit about the future, but, but really what are you seeing in the next year, even five years for the Hartford Athletic? Yeah, I think, the, I think a couple of the, the keys are um, we're going to go after a, a stadium improvement project. Um, we, we, we believe, again, to be sustainable, we need more seats and we need premium seating. And along the way, we'll have to figure out what that deal looks like and how we can also give back to the community, because that's always part of the package. And again, this is city owned, right? So I think that's a big piece is can we get there? Because all the teams that are economically the strongest in our league, and, and really nobody makes money, but the economically strongest have the best stadiums and provide the best kind of atmosphere. So I think we have a ways to go there. So that's number one. Two, I think is the women's side. So if we can get stronger, a little bit stronger, we're going to dive in there. I mean, that's my goal, is to dive in. That's a big lift. That's another pro team. It's equitable to the men, right, because that's the way it has to be. It's going to be women-driven, women-run kind of organization. I'm so excited to do that as a father of two daughters or whatever. It's, it's, that's, that's kind of a dream. Um, so we're going we're gonna to shoot for it. I don't know when, and it, things have to work along the way, but that's coming, and I think Hartford... Connecticut is an incredible women's sports state. I mean, the UConn women have done so much for women's sports, um, but we have great women's soccer players here too. So I think Connecticut's gonna really uh, grab onto uh, pro, pro women's soccer. So that's next. In the meantime, uh, we have to also get better on the field, believe it or not. So I, we have the most incredible fans. So we are not a winning club right now, and um, we need to be, and we will be. And we're going to do everything we can. We're investing it big time to get there. But that doesn't mean you get there, not in the short term. But we're going to get there. In the meantime, our fans are showing up, supporting our team. We were losing 2-0 in the last game. In like the 80th minute, they're, they're cheering. There's Let's still go a lot, yeah, a bunch and I'm of people like, there. I'm like, and someone said to me, that must have been a terrible game. Blah, blah, blah. I was like, terrible game? I thought it was an amazing night. Yeah, I hate losing more than anyone or as much as anyone. It feels terrible. It's a kick in the gut. But at the same time, I was like, look at these fans. We have to deliver for these guys. And they're so into it. And I think that's the community kind of atmosphere. Yeah, that's, that's the doing built. it right community-wise. And, and that's, I think, for me, the most exciting thing about this project is our fans. They have been so amazing through COVID, through a team that hasn't been winning. They're trying, but they're not winning. They're showing up chanting, singing, eating, drinking, running around the field, the, the little kids, which, which is insane and fantastic. <laughs> it's like my favorite part. Um, they're showing up and, and I'm so, we're so fortunate in Connecticut to have this kind of community that, that, because I think it helps economically, it helps socially, it helps culturally, maybe it keeps a couple people around, maybe it helps some of our sponsors hire, maybe it helps them to retain, maybe it just has a, a positive overall impact on, on the business and, and just the, the making this a better place to you know, live and work and play. Well, that's something we hear about all the time, right? How do we attract more talent? And that goes hand in hand, having stuff to do, like you said, not just for for families, for younger um, people as well who just want to go hang out exactly. and have a few beers. Exactly. Great. Well, as you kind of, you know, it's been a few years now, right? You've yeah. worn these two hats. What are some of the things that maybe, you know, you've learned on this endeavor about a, a project of this of this size that you would I mean, advise? I, it's funny because I think I could do a pretty good job at advising someone else at this point, but the, the, the tricky part is like, you could read every book and you could get advice. I think you actually have to have the ex do it and get the experience. It, soccer itself is, is a really difficult business. Almost every team in the world loses money. Their valuations may increase if, if they ever you know get there and, and do anything with that. But in the meantime, it's a definitely a difficult business. So I think the experiences I had are on, you know, how do you hire right? 
right? We have a great team and a great staff, but it's taken time to, to get there, and we've made some mistakes along the way. How do you get this, this culture of a winning culture? How do you build that? We haven't really built that yet. We're still working on that. So those are some challenges that I think um, if I was to jump in now, I would be able to accelerate that. But I also feel pretty good, and I, my partners, and, and our, that we've, we have our experiences now, and we're really ready to kind of like go, right? I mean, listen, we started first year, we didn't have a stadium. Then we go through two, two and a half years of COVID. And we finally kind of get going. We're, we're really, we're kind of young yeah. <laughs> in a way. Um, so we got all those experiences and now it's like, what can we do with them? So there's been a tremendous amount of learning. Um, and I think we're very uh, introspective as a, as a business. I think we, we take a look at what we do right and what we do wrong. Um, we're, we're, very, we're just as happy to, to be looking at what we're not doing right as we are to say, maybe even more, because it, if we can fix that, it's gonna be amazing. So I think, I think there's been too many. I, I, I say that if I ever wrote a book, it would be like so many mistakes. But the end of it's gonna be a championship, stadium, and an amazing community kind of asset that will be here for multi-generations. And it's really how you adapt to those mistakes, right? And, and pivot. I mean, it, usually too slow. I like we should be adapting <laughs> quicker. Um, we're pretty good at analyzing, but it, it takes time. It really does. I, I, I don't really believe in in businesses like I've never been. My business at Datamel is completely organically built. We've never acquired another company. We've never been acquired. It's just incremental. I mean, we have a print room, a very large print room, and we've moved the wall in that print room four times. People are like, well, I don't understand. Why didn't you just build that wall out and fill it? We're like, no, we're just going to go incrementally. And as we get strong and sustained, we grow. And that's kind of that's kind of all I know. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're applying that same model. That that's the only model. I'm I'm not gutsy enough to, you know, really go all in. I want to see incremental improvement, and and we have, and um, and I'm okay with that. We're in for the long haul. We know it's hard, um, but if we can, and again, that fan base is what really gives you the strength to want to invest more, and it is an investment. Like We're putting more dollars in in order to grow. Uh, we're still kind of in that um, model at this point. All right. Well, I think we're really excited to see where this goes, and I know, you know, in the next couple of weeks, there's a lot of exciting things coming up. So, all I can uh, we'll say to, to, to your listeners, and I love the CBIA. I've been a member for forever, and, and I'm very thankful that we have you here in Connecticut. But to to your members, come out to a game. Come out to a game. If you come out to a game, I promise that that you will have an amazing time out there. It is just fun. So that's my one pitch. Give it a shot. Come on out, and um, I think you'll have a great time. Great. Well, thank you so much for uh, be being a guest today on sure. our podcast, and thank you to all of our listeners. You can listen, like, and subscribe to the, our podcast wherever you get your podcasts, and please leave us a review. Let us know if you have ideas for a future podcast. And as always, for a full list of episodes, head on over to CBIA.com.